afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a great weekend. Uh, today, uh, Medical Center has 36 COVID patients. That's um, uh, a, a lot better than the last week. We did have, have several deaths over the weekend, uh, but today we have 36 COVID in-house. 13 of those are on our 7 Central, 13 are on 8 Central, 8 of them are in CCU, and out of those 8, 5 of those are on the ventilator. Um, we, we do not have any patients in our overflow in the Wheatley Stewart building, so that's good news today. Uh, we do have two in uh, labor and delivery, so uh, we're dealing with that. Um, also, I have a note in here that we're expecting five additional discharges this afternoon, so that's going to change the number uh, even more there. Uh, so we have one patient from Permian Basin Community Center, five patients from Siena Nursing, and rehab, four patients from Andrews, two from Fort Stockton, and one from Stanton. 3,382 tests have been negative, 339 are still pending with no suspected cases in house. So for a total, we tested 4,571, but the number of patients in house today is um, a little bit encouraging. Don't wanna to get too over overexcited about it because we know how fast that can change, but um, we like that number. And I'll uh, hand it off to Kristen if you've got anything, Kristen. I know just the um, discharges that we have expected this afternoon. So I think we're um, seeing some good movement on our patients getting better. Thank you guys. Uh, Stacy, would you like to go over the OMC numbers? Yes, thank you, Trevor. Uh, Odessa Regional has tested 1,441. Individuals, 278 of those are positive. Uh, we have seven pending currently, which is the lowest pending number we've had in some time. Uh, for our in-house patients, we have 16 currently in-house. That's up two from Friday, uh, but our average last week was right at this number, so we too feel like that we've stabilized somewhat. Uh, we do have nine patients on ventilators, which is up one uh, from last week. But again, pretty close to the average. We had 10 in the early part of the week last week. Uh, we did also have uh, a death over the weekend. So our thoughts and prayers are with uh, that family. Um, uh, two discharges since uh, Friday and five new admissions. But otherwise, the census itself is holding pretty steady. So I agree with Russell. That is good news for both of us. Dr. Chairman. Thank you, Trevor. Hope everyone had a good weekend. Uh, I did want to uh, touch on the new um, uh, release from uh, Oxford University and AstraZeneca about the vaccines that they've been trialing. They're still in phase one. Uh, for people to understand, there's at least three phases. When we go to phase three is when we're towards the end of releasing the efficacy data for a vaccine. So we're still you know, several months away, several months away from releasing efficacy data. Uh, manufacturers are already looking at this and saying, hey, if this becomes positive, we need to ramp up manufacturing. Uh, so I just want people to understand that uh, even if this first vaccine that they're talking about uh, showing some favorable results starts to bear fruit, it'll take at least five to six months in order to get that first vaccine out for people to use. And that's the earliest possibility. My, my bet's still on early part of next year for a vaccine to come out for the coronavirus, but uh, this is something that we need to understand in the time frame. So when news comes out, oh, positive results, doesn't mean the vaccine's coming out tomorrow. So that's uh, what I wanted to clarify. That's it, thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Sherman. Um, Eddie's just joining us as well. Um, Eddie, do you have uh, counting numbers to update? Trevor, the uh, numbers are not in yet. Uh, we're still trying to play catch up from all the new hires and stuff. So uh, as soon as they're in, we'll update them to the uh, website. And uh, if they're in before this meeting's over, I will again uh, let you know. Okay. All right. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, Dr. Benton joining us as well. Do you have anything uh, from the county, sir, or any news to, to report? Is there potentially any sort of good news with more people wearing masks? Are we, are we starting to see a slightly less sharp incline? Sure, yeah, potentially good news, but it's maybe too early to project exactly, but the curve has flattened off a little bit the last few days. The slope of the graph is not going up. 
it's flattened, but it, it hasn't trended back down completely. Although the number of new cases per day is down some. Uh, positive news to hear that census at the hospital has come down a little bit too. So, but, but I don't want us to let down our caution, let down our guard. I absolutely got to keep up the, the masks and, and watch for our social distancing and things to keep the spread down. Thank you, Dr. Benton. Uh, Mayor, do you have anything to add before we get to media questions? Well, we're very excited to hear that uh, since the uh, cases at the hospitals are coming down, uh, the governor again once stated that he will not be shutting communities down. If I had to guess, what I would say is probably he's going to allow mayors to do it. I know Houston is wanting to um, pull back some, and I know Austin has already shut down for a week. And so um, that's what I would expect, not that he would come out and say uh, he is shutting communities down. But I will let you know when I hear. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, looks like first up on the list today, let me scroll to the top here, is like normal, Mike Merlot, that's American. Hey, Mayor, um, I was wondering if you could kind of reiterate, um, you know, what, what the city's CARE um, Act money is going to and what is that for specifically? There's, it's a broad range that the money can be used for. We've spent $750,000 on the eight tests um, that we're doing free to the community. We've also increased the amount of um, protective equipment that um, in the old, before coronavirus, we had three months worth of N95s, um, gowns, face shields and everything. We've increased that to six months uh, because it really got close at the end uh, for running out of um, N95s and things like that. We've also increased uh, on some equipment on the ambulances. Um, if a paramedic is having to do chest compressions, there is a fear that fluids will come up and get on the phone. So we've actually been in the process of purchasing machines that do the compression uh, so that we're not having to use paramedics because if it gets into the paramedic side, we lose those for at least two weeks. Uh, also bought another it's basically a small tent that they can put over a gurney to transport COVID positive patients to make sure that they're okay. We're also talking, uh, we have a task force put together to look at what we can do for small businesses. Um, also other plans, what we can do to help Meals on Wheels because uh, they're being inundated. Um, also with the homeless shelters and that's what we've been working on. Okay, and uh, I, I guess for for the the city, is it is it for reimbursements due to coronavirus? It, um, and and can each business apply for for these funds themselves, or do they have to go through the city? That was a question I got. We are reader. working on that process right now. Hopefully, going to have that out either next week or the next week, um, because the big cities automatically got their money, uh, whereas we've had to right. apply for it, and so that's. Um, slowed it a little bit but we're in the process right. uh, of coming up we have three council members that are working on that uh, to make sure it's equitable uh, and that it's uh, shared equally right but it um, I guess the city wasn't given uh, cares act funds so they could disperse them to different small businesses this is something different than usual correct part of the coronavirus from the federal government. Uh, we actually received what we call CDBG, which is Community Development Block Grant Money, which goes to um, parts, certain parts of town that are economically challenged. Uh, we've been able to allocate some of that. And um, we received some, but we have not received it all. Okay. Okay. Um, and I guess uh, for individual businesses, um, can they also apply for CARES or do they depend on the city's CARES money? Yeah, well, the process will go through the city. There's actually companies that do this to make sure it's allocated um, correctly and that's what they're working on right now. So hopefully in the next week or two we'll have the answer. Okay, all right. And then um, I guess our, some city employees are getting overtime uh, from the CARES, right? Well, if we have paramedics out, uh, we have to go into overtime. 
they're using it for that. Some of the firemen the same way, uh, because all our firemen are paramedics, so they can all ride the ambulance. But when you have employees out due to COVID, we're not at full staff uh, in police or in fire. And so we have to use overtime. Okay. And then, um, you know, that is that also include, I guess, the city testing sites? That was part of it. We allocated $750,000 to take care of the cost of that because we had to hire of, medical of workers. And, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. And then um, I guess for medical professionals, I had a question from a reader. Um, they say their friend's husband tested positive um, and they are around their friend daily. Do they need to quarantine? I Dr. Benton, do you want to jump in on there? <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Benton. That's always a difficult uh, question. So that's secondhand exposure potential. Yeah. So the, the real important thing is knowing whether that middle person is positive or becomes symptomatic before you can really determine what the third person should do. Okay. Difficult question. So it, it yeah, it kind of depends then on, on what that second hand is. All right. Um, and, and unless there's anything else anyone wants to add to that, uh, that, that is my uh, last question for the day. So appreciate Thanks, it. Mike. All right. Next up I see is Andrea from CBS7. Okay. Hi. Okay. So my first question is, um, I know a few weeks ago we talked about there being um, backlogs of testing uh, because the lab that was being used, CPL, was backed up. Is that still an issue right now? So on our end, we're seeing that the labs are coming back. They're still um, a little longer than what obviously we would like. Um, they're a little longer than the state testing, but we're seeing them coming back quicker than what they were. And CPL is back open for business. In fact, we met with them last week on just overall processes and how to make it even quicker than, than what we already have. That's the same for Odessa Regional too. A couple of weeks ago, we, we had over almost 190 tests pending. Uh, and in that high range for a couple of days. And as I said earlier, we're only down to seven pending. And so it's definitely uh, moving quicker now. Thank you very much. Um, so with the mask order being implemented at the beginning of the month and then now 4th of July, could we be seeing the effects of both of those um, competing like contexts in the test that we like the numbers that we get today well I'll, I'll probably add about the fourth of july weekend itself I, I think we're just about outside that range now so i would start to say that the people that we're seeing now are probably not necessarily related to the fourth of july and i'm i'm cautious with my words because this is a new enough virus that we don't know enough about exactly there's no two week exact cutoff we think the incub incubation period could be up to two weeks but it could be longer too so uh i, I'm, I think i'm safely, cautiously saying that we're probably outside that zone. What we see now is cases that happened after. Dr. Benton? Yeah, I would agree that the average time of onset after exposure is five, seven days, somewhere in there. But I've seen it as long as 13 days out. So, you know, there could be some cases still occur from 4th of July. But hopefully we're on the, the tail end of that. I do believe masks are making a difference. And then, um, Trevor, would anybody from there want to speak about um, the Chick-fil-A donation? Yeah, Kristen Russell, you guys want to take that? Um, sure. 
I'm waiting to see if Russ was going yeah. <laughs> to. Uh, we've had, yeah, I'll talk about that. If you remember last week, our, our mayor here, he made a, they made a very nice donation, Subway did, and we appreciate that. And then today we received a donation from the new Chick-fil-A on 191 in Fodry of uh, uh, 75 um, meals for a year. Um, and so we're going to roll those out in the COVID units as well. I think just the generosity of this whole community, um, whether that's businesses or individuals, uh, you know, West Texas folks take care of West Texas folks the best. And um, we sure do appreciate everything this community has done and, um, and uh, has continued to do through this whole process. It's, it's, a, it's a blessing and we're appreciative of that. You know, the health department wants to throw a big thank you out to uh, Mayor Turner's subways as well. He, uh, he contributed to the health department. Thank y'all. Okay, one more question. Um, Kristen, I think this might be for you. Uh, will today's release of five patients be the single, the biggest single day release of patients? No, oh, we've been averaging every few days. It seems like, like last week we had four to six patients a day go home. Um, unfortunately, we were getting those admissions back in within a few hours. Um, so it was kind of balancing out, but we've had a few days of the four to six discharge range as well. Great, thank y'all. That's all I have. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, next up is uh, Danny. Danny, you got anything? Yeah, um, this to the medical community. The, pa the COVID patients that have been discharged, have you had any come back with uh, other secondary illnesses? We haven't had any readmissions flagged on my screen um, since they've gone home. Um, if they have come across and they haven't counted in my readmission numbers. Uh, Danny, you've seen, you've seen at least one patient come back with worsening of COVID symptoms here. Remember, we, that's the person that ended up passing away a couple of weeks ago. Um, but that's a very good question. We don't know enough about the long-term effects of this virus yet. Uh, and there is a lot more coming out in the media now about people coping with possibly long-term effects of the COVID disease. In one of the previous news conferences that I'd mentioned about children, and we said, you know, how children don't get it as often, they don't get as sick from it, but that doesn't mean that children have no effect at all from the COVID virus. We actually don't know enough about what it would affect long term. And same would go for adults. There's in fact a lot of good patient groups in social media already out there that are speaking about some of their long term effects. Uh, they haven't been fully characterized yet. So I can't tell you, well, this is what it's going to cause. But there is a lot out there already in those discussions. We haven't seen any of those come back to the hospital just yet. Or, or enough of a pattern for us to notice that somebody's come back with, with that. Uh, but Dr. Benton, did, could, have you seen any of that stuff in the media as well? Yeah, I mean, I've seen reports around, but I have not experienced personally any of these readmissions or additional uh, illnesses after COVID. But yes, we, it's novel. We just don't know enough about it as to what may lie ahead for some folks. Danny, anything else? That's it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Danny. Uh, looks like up next is uh, Mitch. Uh, hey, y'all. This is a question for the hospitals. Uh, are y'all, other than Crane, watching any other communities uh, for how the other uh, outbreak or the virus is developing in rural West Texas? Hey, Mitch, this is Russell. I think uh, right now our two big hotspots that uh, we are watching, of course, we have four in here from Andrews today, so we're keeping a close eye on what's going on in Andrews. I noticed that their cases have gone over 200 or they're right at 200 over the weekend, uh, and also Fort Stockton as well. Uh, we've seen a little uptick from both of those, but I think, uh, especially given as many people that travel uh, around in West Texas, that those are probably the two biggest um, Hot spots that we're watching uh, really on an hour by hour basis just to see what's going on um, in those two communities. Stacy? 
Any how about y'all? We've not really seen um, much of an increase from any area. I think uh, you've probably gotten most of those at Medical Center. We do currently have one uh, who's in-house um, from Reeves County. And outside of that, we've had a, a few sporadic patients from outlying areas on occasion, but never uh, even very many at one time. So I think we're doing fine. And Stacey, just a quick follow-up. The person, uh, the individual who died over the weekend, were they from Ector County? Yes. Well, I think those are all my questions today. Thanks, y'all. Thanks. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, up next, uh, scrolling down the list, um, I think uh, Tatum. Well, I think you're on mute. There we go. I always do that, even in our uh, team meetings. Always on mute. Okay. Um, so I mean, I've already uh, answered this question. I, I know I joined on late, um, but is there any sort of update to the Ector County Jail and inmates or anybody testing positive for COVID? I know we talked about that maybe two weeks ago, two, three weeks ago. Just looking for an update. What's the situation? So uh, as of our last court meeting, which was Tuesday of last week, we were still around 10, most of them being the jailers. So uh, I think we've kind of got that under control. Uh, it's a good sign that it hasn't gone up and they're doing a, a pretty good job of uh, keeping everybody isolated and, and self quarantine within their own structure. And Kristen, I think you brought this up last week. Y'all talked about um, moving forward with bringing in you know, pastoral staff or bringing those in to you know, talk to employees and um, patients. Has that started? Yes. Um, we have debriefing sessions that have been going on just simply because of our employee death. Um, but the pastoral visitation is on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So they should be allowed in the facility for those with an active badge. Um, beginning in the morning between the hours of 10 and 12 and then again in the afternoon from 4 to 6. That's great. How has the response been? Uh, the staff have been very appreciative. They're looking forward to it. Um, and as far as the debrief sessions, um, I think that's always something that they're appreciative of. Um, we just don't really push and ask any feedback after they go to those. So. Sure. Okay. Great. That's, that's all I have. Thank you, Tatum. And I think that's pretty much everybody. Does uh, anybody else, before we go, uh, have any questions they'd like to ask? You know, All Trevor, right. I, have a, I have a comment on a question that Michael asked about the secondhand exposure, so to speak. You know, if you think you've had secondhand exposure or even firsthand exposure, but that person's test has not come back yet, I mean, there is certainly nothing wrong with acting like you've got it. I mean, just take extra precautions. Don't go around anybody that's, that's compromised. Uh, just, you know, always err on the side of safety. Thank you, Eddie, we appreciate that. Uh, anybody else have anything to say before we go? All right, Russell, you wanna close this out until Wednesday? All right, gang, uh, this seemed kind of appropriate for today, but in Colossians 4, 6, it says, let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So I think that that is very fitting for what uh, we do on here. So uh, be safe and have a great afternoon.